Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me just start by briefly explaining the um, picture I have chosen here as the backdrop. Um, basically, I wanted to have something which illustrates the basic aspects of quantum fields, the wave nature, and um, the particle nature, which is something which I will be um, discussing. Obviously, this is, these are waves in water, but one nice thing about quantum fields as a topic is that absolutely everything you see around you is made of quantum fields. So whatever I had, I had chosen uh, for this picture, it would be a picture of quantum fields. So water is a perfectly fine example of that. Okay, um, then I will want to move to thanks, thank yous. And first of all, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I realize that it's a very nice day outside, and so I really appreciate that so many of you have chosen to come to this lecture theater instead. Um, also, I want to thank you some um, people who have really been very influential for my um, research career, starting with my PhD supervisor, Keijo Kajantie, who unfortunately is not here today, but um, who was really um, the inspiration for, for my research and basically set the direction, uh, initial direction for that. Two other very influential people were Mark Hindmarsh and Ed Copeland, and they are both here, and Mark will give the vote of thanks. And um, they were um, my first, after getting my PhD, moved to the University of Sussex, and I worked with, with these um, these people there, and that was really um, a fantastic time. And finally, um, last but definitely not least, uh, Tom Kibble, which I should actually have put Sir Tom. Um, but yeah, Tom, um, who is obviously here in a theory group and uh, really has been a, a massive inspiration for, for, for my research. And we will uh, come back to Tom's contribution, um, both um, specifically in, in my talk, but also more generally for uh, particle physics, which has been massive. Also, I would like to thank my uh, PhD students over the years, some of whom are here, as some were not able to come, but it's been a pleasure to work with, with all of you. It's been really fantastic. And um, some of you are still working on your PhD, some of you have got, um, got elsewhere, but everyone is, has really been um, successful and great. And also all my other uh, collaborators, so I won't read the whole list, but, um, but yes, I've really been very fortunate to be able to work with so many, so many fantastic people. And Finally, my family sit in the front row, uh, who have been very tolerant of uh, an academic in the family, and, uh, and also my parents, um, Mario, who is my mother, and uh, Jukka, who is my father, and their um, new, new partners. And I uh, should just mention that um, even though I was the first uh, professor in in my family. I'm a second generation professor because my father, Jukka, became professor just a month ago. So, <laughs> Okay, and so we already heard where I come from, originally from Finland, and went through Sussex and Cambridge before coming here 10 years ago. Really enjoyed being at Imperial, and uh, it's a fantastic Place, and so I was made professor of theoretical physics two years ago. So as you can tell, the inaugural lectures are running a little bit behind. <laughs> like two years is a short time in our department, so many people are giving their inaugurals uh, quite, a, quite a lot later. Um, I was traveling. I think I was actually in Helsinki when I heard about my professorship. So it was, it was my wife who uh, broke the news uh, to my kids, and my son, um, who was three years old then, 
said, no, daddy must not become like that. <laughs> and I still don't know whether that was because he hadn't spent enough time with other physics professors to learn what they are like or whether he had spent too much time <laughs> with them. Okay, anyway, so let's, let's get started with the, with the physics. So where I want to start is three years ago, um, 2012, 4th of July, it's a really big day for particle physics. Uh, the two experiments at CERN, ATLAS and CMS, announced that they had discovered a new elementary particle, um, which later was confirmed was the Higgs boson, which they had been looking, particle physicists had been looking for um, a long, long time. And, um, and so what I want to be um, uh, doing in this talk is explaining what that means and also where we will be heading next. So what's next for particle physics after this um, discovery? And, um, and also what, so when the Higgs was discovered, it was widely said it was sort of missing piece, the last piece in the standard model that completed the standard model of particle physics. So I want to discuss what that means, explain what uh, the standard model of particle physics is. And in particular, the key thing about the standard model of particle physics I will focus on is the fact that it is a quantum field theory. So I want to talk about that and what quantum fields are. Um, and, um, and then I will talk about the three uh, more uh, specific topics which are related to this quantum field nature of particle physics. So three phenomena which, um, where the quantum field aspects really um, become important and the fact that the particles, the elementary particles that we normally refer to as particles are not just particles but they are quantum fields. And so those are vacuum stability, I will uh, tell more, you will explain what I mean by that. The role of the Higgs boson in the early universe and, um, and magnetic monopoles. But um, let me first start with this. So basically, um, particle physics generally. And um, particle physics in the sort of way, way it's being done today started um, basically in, in 1932 with Cockroft and Walton um, splitting the atom. So they built this particle accelerator, which um, they were able to use to um, split the lithium nucleus. And, um, and that basically then led to bigger and bigger particle accelerators. The point is really just that you take particles, throw them at each other at very high speed so that you um, get a big collision and you then analyze what comes out and learn, about, uh, learn more about those particles. And the energies that we, we've been able to achieve, or particle physicists, experimentalists have been able to achieve, have increased um, massively from those years. So what I will be using in this talk, so I will be using the units a giga electron volts, or GeV, because that's the standard unit of energy that um, we like to use in particle physics. And Cockroft and Walton, what they could reach with their accelerator was uh, 1,000 of a giga electron volt. Now to contrast that with the Large Hadron Collider, you can see which is the current state of the art, started operation in, in 2008, um, it can reach 3,500 giga electron volts and where the, um, the accelerator of Cockroft and Walton could basically fit in a big room. A uh, large hadron collider is 27 kilometers long and it's uh, this massive ring near Geneva going goes across the Swiss uh, French border. And um, in fact, that's, uh, just the comparison of these energies is not quite fair because what Cockroft and Walton did was they uh, shot protons at a fixed target, whereas in the Large Hadron Collider you have protons moving in opposite directions and hitting head-on 
and therefore the energy of the collisions is actually much higher. Um, the sort of center of mass energy is much higher, um, so you shouldn't just compare these. So that you've got much further in terms of energy. And after the discovery of the, of the Higgs boson, Large Hadron Collider was uh, switched off for upgrades, which have now been completed. And now the energy is basically doubled from this. And that's, of course, very exciting. It means that we can now move on to the next second run of the Large Hadron Collider and start to probe a new physics. It's uh, also particularly exciting for me. Um, as a theorist, you normally don't get uh, terribly closely involved with um, experiments, but now I am actually a member of one experimental team in the Large Hadron Collider. It's a little experiment called MEDAL, where I, the, the experimentalists don't let me touch any of the equipment, <laughs> but at least they let me go down to the cave and wear a hard hat, so I can, <laughs> I can take pictures like this. So that's fantastic. Also, it is clearly, it has been exciting for others, and there's been quite a lot of media interest, um, to the extent that on the Easter Sunday, when they switched the Large Hadron Collider back on after the upgrade, I, when I was cooking the lamb for the Easter meal, I got a phone call from the BBC asking if I could come to their evening news bulletin to, to tell more about the Large Hadron Collider and about our experiment. Clearly it was Easter Sunday, so they were desperate to find a <laughs> physicist, and so I was the last one on their list, but still. Um, so that was a very, very um, interesting experience. Um, and yes, so the, the experiment I'm involved in is called MEDAL. It's spelled MODAL, but um, we decided that the O is silent, so it's just medal. And um, it's an experiment which is specifically designed to look for magnetic monopoles, particles, hypothetical particles that carry magnetic charge. And I will come back to that later. But also, if you are interested in, uh, in, interested in knowing more about this, I want to advertise that we are going to um, presenting an exhibit called Monopole Quest, which is about magnetic monopoles and the metal experiment at the Royal Society, the Summer Science Exhibition at the Royal Society um, from the 30th of June. So please come and visit and learn more about uh, this experiment. Okay, um, so with, as you could tell, Particle physics has basically been, um, in the last 80 years, the progress in particle physics has been based on ever increasing energies that we can produce in particle accelerators, starting from Cockroft and Walton. And now, um, now we've got the Large Hadron Collider. And there are plans to build bigger ones. But you can, you can tell that the size of these experiments has really grown, and 27 kilometers is, is already fairly large. You can't really make it massively bigger than that. And so therefore, in the future, it's quite clear that one direction, which is that we, it's quite clear that we need some new directions where to look um, when we want to explore even higher energies. And one direction which my research is very much focused on is uh, using the early universe as the sort of ultimate uh, particle experiment. Because we know, now we know very well, we've got lots of evidence, lots of observational data, which tells us that the universe began in some kind of a big bang, some kind of massive explosion um, 14 billion years ago. And the energies available for any kind of particle processes at that time which is massively higher than anything we can ever hope to reach in particle accelerators. And so therefore, the early universe is really the ideal way of probing particle physics at much higher energies. The problem with that is that we don't have the same kind of control of what we are doing. There's this one 
big experiment that happened 14 billion years ago and we, all we can see all we can do is watch and see what came out and therefore we need a much better understanding of the theory in order to make use of this um, to really do particle physics with the cosmology and that's largely um, the sort of um, a main focus of this um, uh, this talk okay so so as I said what the discovery of the of the Higgs boson at the Large Hadron Collider uh, did was basically complete and confirm the standard model of particle physics and I want to uh, spend a few minutes um, going through what the standard model is and uh, what the elementary particles are and I want to start with um, atoms for a long time well obviously initially it wasn't even known that matter consists of atoms but for a long time um, uh, people thought that atoms are elementary particles that they are the elementary building blocks of matter but um, eventually when we were able to do better and better experiments, it was discovered that an atom actually consists of a compact nucleus surrounded by a cloud of electrons. Now this picture is just an artist's impression. Uh, it's not, not in scale. The nucleus is much smaller. But it means that the atom is not elementary because it consists of nucleus and electrons. And the nucleus is not elementary because the nucleus consists of particles, nucleons, which are either protons or neutrons. And every chemical element has a certain number of protons. The number of protons determines uh, which chemical element we are talking about. A number of neutrons determines which isotope of that element it is. But protons and neutrons are not elementary either. They are made up of quarks and each one of them consists of three smaller particles three quarks and quarks come in different flavors and I have to apologize for the language we physicists want to use but we call them flavors and they're not even very consistent because the names of the flavors are up and down um, but a proton consists of two up quarks one down quark and neutron consists of one up quark and two down quarks and um, as far as we know the quarks are elementary particles so in everyday life the elementary particles um, we sort of need for atoms are here they have up and down quarks and the electrons and photons which carry the electromagnetic force that's keeping uh, them bound keeping the electrons on the orbit around the nucleus of course um, there's also a force that binds the quarks into the nucleon and that's the strong nuclear force and that's carried by a particle called gluon and there are also um, two other force carriers other particles that carry um, what is known as the weak uh, nuclear force and they are called the Z and W bosons and they are responsible for all the nuclear reactions um, that take place for instance in stars so where the Sun gets um, gets it he its heat from so that, that's uh, from the weak nuclear force and and so these are all the particles that are sort of relevant for the everyday lives but there are many more it turns out that there are in addition to the electron there are five other particles which are sort of similar to the electron the electron has um, electrically neutral partner called the neutrino and there are uh, three generations of these so electron and neutrino they have a, there's also a muon which is similar to the electron but heavier and a muon neutrino and tau particle and tau neutrino so there are six leptons um, we, we call these leptons and there are six of them in total but neutrinos because they are 
electrically neutral, they just fly through as we don't notice them. And uh, muons and tau particles are very short-lived. And so they can only be seen in experiments. And similarly, there are three generations of quarks, charm, strange, top, and bottom. <clears throat> and so these are all the matter particles, the quarks and leptons. So the matter is made of them. And then we have the force carriers here. And then the final bit, the final piece in this whole structure was the Higgs boson, which was discovered three years ago. And it's often said that it gives the mass to the other particles. And to some extent, that's true. But more generally, it is something which, which binds them together. Um, so it's, it is really central for the uh, mathematical consistency of the theory. And now that um, the, the, the particle has been found, it really confirms the validity of the whole theoretical structure. Now this is, so this is what we call the standard model of particle physics. It's these elementary particles, and um, it is a really remarkable theory, because it's basically the theory of nearly everything. It describes almost everything except gravity. Everything else, it describes all known particles. Everything we know is made up of these elementary particles. It describes all the forces between them, the, all of their behavior. And the way it does that is in terms of quantum fields. And so that's what I now want to move to, is explain what I mean by that. So what what's these particles are? We often just talk about particle physics. We say that these are particles, but what they really are are quantum fields. So what are quantum fields? And I want to... To, to explain that, I want to move back um, 150 years ago. London must have been a very exciting place for a scientist. This Michael Faraday here was carrying out experiments with electricity and magnetism and presenting them in the Royal Institute. And, uh, and Faraday was really he was a chemist. He was an experimentalist. He did great experiments. It really elucidated the nature of electricity and magnetism. But he wasn't much of a theorist. So it was very fortunate that just down the road at King's College London, there was a theorist called James Clerk Maxwell who um, took these results from the experiments and turned them into a consistent theory called electrodynamics the dynamical theory of the electromagnetic field. And what that theory did, it was really a remarkable theory. Um, because what it did was the concept of, there was a concept of electric and magnetic fields was around at the time. And that's what Faraday was um, exploring. We all know that magnet has two poles and the magnetic field coming out of the magnet and so on. But until Maxwell, this was just seen as a conceptual tool for understanding how magnets and electric charges and electric currents work, or just mathematical description of them. But what, Ma what Maxwell showed was that actually the electric and magnetic fields are physical dynamical entities which evolve on their own. So even if you have empty space, you have vacuum, you have electric and magnetic fields in the vacuum, they will evolve. They have their own dynamics, irrespective of any electric charges which are present. And the way they evolve is in form of waves. So what his theory showed was that electric and magnetic fields can form waves. And those waves are, of course, electromagnetic waves, radio waves, or light, or electromagnetic radiation. And so this was the first appearance of a field as a dynamical object. And that's basically the basis of what we mean by quantum fields. And I should say that this, that we are, this year now is the International Year of Light, and that's partly because of the, 
of the theory of, of electrodynamics, which was um, um, developed 150 years ago. And it was a really remarkable theory because it was a relativistic theory. Even though it was 40 years before Einstein discovered um, a special relativity. But it, it is a relativistic description of electromagnetic field. It obviously also was the basis of, uh, I would say, most of the um, 20th century technology. Almost all, a large part of it is based on electromagnetism. So really, it was absolutely remarkable theory. And the final thing where it was remarkable was that it was also very instrumental as motivation for quantum mechanics, the big revolution that happened at the start of the 20th century. And um, the way, one, uh, one way in which it influenced um, the development of quantum mechanics was through the photoelectric effect. And the photoelectric effect is what happens with some, some metals when you shine light on them. The light creates electric currents. Um, it basically kicks some electrons off the, off the surface of the metal. And it didn't fit the, the wave picture. The idea that light, uh, the light, is consist, uh, light consists of these electromagnetic waves. And what Albert Einstein showed in his miracle year, 1905, the same year when he discovered special relativity and um, the theory of Brownian motion, uh, he showed that actually this photoelectric effect can be, can be understood and described very accurately if you imagine that light consists of particles, that this piece of metal is actually bombarded by particles of light, quantum particles, which you now call photons. And this is actually the discovery that gave Albert Einstein his Nobel Prize. And so what we see from here is that light is, in many ways, it looks like a wave, but also in some situations it behaves like a particle. So what is it? Is it, is it a wave or is it a particle? Now a similar thing happened at around the same time with matter particles. So um, electrons were discovered by this guy, J.J. Thompson. Um, it was basically showing that when you have electric current, it actually consists of particles, light electrically charged particles, which were then named electrons. But 30 years later, G.P. Thompson, J.J.'s son, um, did some experiments with electrons and showed that actually, when you, when you uh, do certain types of experiments, basically uh, send a beam of electrons through a crystal, you get uh, patterns which, are, which you wouldn't get from particles, but which, you could, which look exactly like what you would get if electrons were waves. And so he showed that electrons behave as waves. So, and G.P. Thompson, was professor of physics here at Imperial College. So when you go out of the lecture theater after the talk, you can see a copy of the Nobel Prize certificate on the wall just outside the lecture theater. Okay, and his discovery was really instrumental. And that was basically there were several experiments at the time which showed that the classical picture of matter as made of particles must be wrong. And that led to uh, development of quantum mechanics, um, a theory which describes particles as part waves, uh, part particles, in the sense that the state of a particle, the particle doesn't have a, um, a definite position, doesn't have well-defined position. Instead, the state of the particle consists of superposition of different classical states. So basically it means that can be in many places at the same time. And this is described by what we call the wave function, which gives the probability of finding the particle at the given position. So when you do a measurement 
try to find, measure the position of the particle. It always looks like a particle. You find it in a given position. But the actual behavior between the measurements is described by the wave function. And therefore, between the measurements, it behaves like waves. Now, this is a very weird theory. Um, and still, we don't, underst we don't really understand. We don't know how to interpret uh, quantum mechanics. But we've learned to live with it. And we've learned to do calculations with it. But um, basically, what, what uh, the G.P. Thompson saw and what this means in practice, uh, this wave particle duality, you can see it very well in the double slit experiment, which um, consists of a source of particles. And let's say they could be light or they could be electrons, like in G.P. Thompson's experiment. And but let me just talk about light. So you shine the light through uh, this plate, which has two slits. And uh, if, they were, if, if these were classical particles, the particle could go through either of these slits. If the particle goes through this slit, it would end up here. And if it goes through this slit, it would end up here. And it could bounce a little bit of this plate, so you get some um, spread of positions here. So you get one peak here and one peak here for the positions of the particles. And, um, and that's how classical particles would behave. But waves, on the other hand, when you have waves traveling through these, when they get through these two slits, they would interfere. The wave fronts would, um, would mix with each other, and you'd get some places where the wave has a, where they, the, the phases of the two waves add up, and that's where you get a peak. And you get some positions where the, the, two, the phases of the two waves are just opposite and they cancel each other. And therefore, you'd get this kind of pattern that um, we call interference. And that is what you see with normal waves. You can do this experiment with water waves. This is how light behaves. And what um, uh, G.P. Thompson essentially showed was that this is how electrons behave as well. So you see this interference pattern here. And that's a really remarkable um, result because it means that the particles, particles just don't go through one of the holes. Particle going through this hole knows about the existence of the other hole, the other slit. And so in effect, the particle, it's better to think that it goes through both of the holes at the same time. You don't have a particle just following one path from the source uh, to the screen, but it basically knows about the other slit as, as well. And this leads to the modern way of thinking about uh, quantum mechanics, which is known as path integrals. And in effect, when you take this picture of a uh, double slit experiment and just remove uh, the plate from the middle, um, so in the double slit case, we found that the wave here is the sum of the two waves, one wave going through this slit and one wave going through this slit. And in the same way, you should just remove the whole plate here. The, the total wave you get on this wall is, would be the sum of, of all possible They take the waves corresponding to each of these slit positions and add all of them together. And that gives you the total wave function here at the screen. And so therefore, the total wave function, if you don't have the plate there, is given by an integral, the sum over all possible uh, parts that the particle can take. Or actually call it the path integral, so integrate over all possible a parts that the particle can take from the initial position to the final position. So in some sense, in quantum mechanics, the particle doesn't have a well-defined position, doesn't have a well-defined path that it takes from one point to another, but it follows, in some sense, all possible paths at the same time, and they, you have to sum them in this very specific way. 
Um, quantum particles also exhibit some other a very interesting behavior. And one example that is tunneling. So if you imagine this kind of a position, we have a classical ball uh, at the bottom of this uh, a hole here. It would, you know, a normal ball would just stay there. But in quantum mechanics, there's a small probability that the ball can tunnel through this wall to the other side and then um, crawl down. In the same way, so in, in classical mechanics, if you leave something on the table, you can be sure that it stays there. But in quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics actually tells you that it can tunnel through the table if you wait long enough. And this is often a very, very slow process, but there are some cases when it is fairly fast and you can see it. For example, radioactive decay is an example of this tunneling um, phenomenon. But this, and, and this is the sort of quantum mechanical view of particles, but this picture actually doesn't describe everything. It was very soon noticed that you need to go beyond this because there are processes that change the number of particles. So the particles can't be the, the sort of basis for how you, how you describe nature. And it's easiest to see this for uh, the electromagnetic field, the photons, uh, particles of the electromagnetic field, because you can have an atom absorbing one of a photon and emitting two. And so in order to describe this, you need something more than uh, quantum mechanics where you are describing uh, everything in terms of the position of the particles, like here. And that's where, the wave, uh, that's where the field nature comes in. So instead of using the position as the relevant variable, it actually, you should actually use the electromagnetic field. And what that means is that the state of the electromagnetic field at any given time is not a single a classical field. The field doesn't have a definite value at any given time. Instead, it's a superposition of all possible values. And um, again, you can describe it with a fast integral where you're integrating or summing over all possible ways your electromagnetic field can evolve over time. The same applies to matter particles. There are processes where you can uh, produce uh, particles from either collisions of other particles or strong electromagnetic fields can produce particles and antiparticles. And therefore, the number of matter particles also can change. And therefore, you also need a quantum field theory description for, um, for matter particles. And in the same way as with the electromagnetic field, we therefore introduce this kind of a path integral. We introduce a field which describes the elementary particle and we have to sum over all possible um, configurations of that field. And that is basically what the standard model is. Every one of these elementary particles that's shown here corresponds to a quantum field, corresponds to a variable in this integral. So we've got a single integral. This is a infinite dimensional, very complicated integral, but it's a single integral which we can write down, which describes all of these elementary particles and their physics. So basically, you can write down an integral which describes everything in nature except gravity. And that's an absolutely remarkable achievement and very proud to be uh, here at Imperial because Imperial College uh, people here have played a massively important role in the development of this theory, and in particular, Abdus Salam, who was the founder of the theoretical physics group here, um, and Tom Kibble, where really have made uh, central contributions in the development of this theory. Sadly, this integral, this integral is very difficult uh, to calculate. So um, we, can't, we can't actually do this in practice. And the way, way we um, often do that is using what we call perturbation theory, which is uh, essentially consists of um, representing the integral 
um, in terms of this kind of diagrams, which you can interpret as virtual particles. So you have this diagram describes just a particle um, propagating in space time, but you can also draw more diagrams where, you, where the particle, like this could be the electron, it emits a photon and then absorbs the photon, sends out the photon and then captures the photon um, shortly afterwards. And because the, this photon just, so you can imagine time going this way, so the photon only lives for a very short time and therefore we call it a virtual particle. And in principle, the, the, this whole path integral is given, corresponds to an infinite number of this kind of Feynman diagrams, but each one of them uh, can be written as an integral which we can calculate. And if, like in some cases, um, just taking the first few of these diagrams gives a very good approximation, uh, then this is a very useful tool because we just have to calculate a few diagrams and then we get a very good, um, um, a, a, a good result. And in that case, that works when the interactions between the particles are weak or when we have small number of particles uh, involved. And in that case, we can think of quantum fields as being just a classical particle plus a small quantum correction. And I would just like to briefly mention one example where this works incredibly well, and that's uh, the magnetic moment of the electron, which is basically describing how the electron behaves in the magnetic field. Now, if the electron was a classical particle, this parameter, um, which we denote by g over 2, would be equal to 1. In quantum field theory, the standard model, we can calculate this very accurately. In fact, if you just calculate uh, 6,000 of those diagrams, and you get this prediction uh, for this magnetic moment. And this can be measured, and the measurement is, measured value is given here, and you can see that these two numbers agree to 11 decimal places. And that's, that shows how incredibly accurate theory the standard model is, because we can really predict things to 11 decimal places. I don't think there's really many other um, theories in science that are as accurate as, as this. So it's really just unbelievable uh, level of agreement. Um, but the theory does have some uh, problems associated with it, in particular um, that when you do this kind of calculations, you have to calculate these um, diagrams, the integrals corresponding to these diagrams. And each one of those diagrams actually on its own <laughs> diverges, it gives an infinite answer. And um, early on, physicists found ways of handling with this, but we're not, we're very um, worried about whether, whether um, that was legitimate. And for instance, Paul Dirac, who was one of the, um, one of the pioneers of quantum field theory, uh, said that he was very dissatisfied with the situation where you get, um, do a calculation where you get infinite answers and you somehow have to massage them uh, to get predictions. So even, even, if the, even if at the end of the day your calculations were as accurate as this, um, it seemed that the, the, the way of getting to the answer was not legitimate. Now this changed later when um, Ken Wilson um, here understood how this process of dealing with these infinities should really be understood. And what it actually represents is the fact that our theories are just effective theories. We shouldn't think of the standard model as the fundamental theory valid to all energy scales, but only a theory that is valid up to some finite energy scale. And if you want to go higher energies than that, then you need a different theory. And within each theory you can, you can make, you can do calculations and the results are independent of whatever you have at higher energies. And this is something which we are very used to in science. So if you think of 
uh, in terms of energy scales. Um, here we have been talking about particle physics, the standard model. But if you go to lower energies, you get to nuclear physics. You go to even lower energies, you don't even need to use nuclear physics. You can just use chemistry to describe physics at lower energies. And even uh, lower energy scales, you can think of just biology uh, or even lower energies. You can think of classical physics um, consisting of just classical um, everyday objects. So in the same way, at different energy scales, you have different theories and different parameters, different constants of nature, um, which just describes the physics at that energy scale. And that's what these infinities uh, were really telling you, that, um, that um, you, you can't trust your theory to arbitrarily high energies. But what is remarkable about the standard model is that actually... If you then ask how high up we can go in energy with the standard model. Um, the standard model allows us to, in principle, um, do calculations at any energy. And we can, we can see how the parameters of the theory, as I said, we need different theories and different parameters um, depending on the energy that we are looking at. We can calculate how the changes with energy and turns out that the parameters remain finite and small all the way to um, very high energy scales, a million billion times as high as what we can reach with the Large Hadron Collider. And at that energy scale, we would expect quantum gravity to become important anyway. So um, we know that the standard model can't be a valid theory there anymore. So in some sense, it seems that the standard model is a even though we can only probe it at an energy scale that we can read with the Large Hadron Collider, it could actually be valid uh, to much higher energies all the way to the energy of, the, of quantum gravity. Okay, and now let me um, move to these examples of where, um, where um, quantum field theory aspects can be or are important. And one of them is, the, is what we call the vacuum stability. And that's to do with the, with, the, with the way the parameters of the standard model depend on the energy scale. And you can see these are the strengths of different forces, different interactions. And here we have this one parameter, lambda, which you can see this increasing energy, it becomes negative. And that means that when you go to very high energies, the interaction between Higgs particles, um, the theory predicts that it becomes attractive. And therefore, you start to, um, if, you, if, you, if you get to those energies, it becomes more and more um, energetically favorable to, uh, to produce more and more Higgs particles. And um, essentially, the more Higgs particles you produce, the the lower the energy becomes, and eventually you go to some negative energy state. And there's a potential wall between our vacuum and this negative energy state in the space of fields. And now, as I said, quantum particles can tunnel through walls. And in the same way, quantum fields can tunnel, tunnel through this kind of potential walls. And what that means is that, in principle, the Higgs field, which is currently at this low energy value, could tunnel through this um, potential barrier, the potential wall, to the other side where you have this unstable negative energy state. And this got quite a lot of, and this depends very sensitively on the mass of the, of the Higgs particle, so this only became relevant when it was measured to be 125 giga electron volts. And this made quite a lot of um, headlines when it was discovered. The cosmos may be inherently unstable. The vacuum state where we are could actually um, be unstable and decay. Stephen Hawking stepped in and warned 
uh, that if you build an even bigger particle accelerator, that could destroy the universe. Because what this means is that if we tunnel the negative energy state, um, we would create a bubble of the negative energy vacuum, which would grow and fill the whole universe. Now, yes, that in principle that could happen, but luckily, just like with these glasses um, staying on top of the table, the lifetime, the, the tunneling rate through this wall is incredibly slow, and therefore the risk of this ever happening is incredibly weak. So in principle, the vacuum might not be stable. In practice, luckily, it is. Um, however, one question about this is if you go to uh, the early universe, where the energy is very much higher, then could, could you then have processes that take you over this barrier? So how did the universe survive, uh, the very early universe? And there, again, the quantum field aspects become very important because quantum fields can, particles always behave in the, in, in the, um, in the same way in, um, even if you have highly curved space-time like you had in the early universe. But quantum fields feel the curvature. And there's a parameter in the standard model that describes how the Higgs field uh, feels the curvature of the space-time. And this is a parameter that we haven't been able to measure uh, in the Large Hadron Collider. But actually it turns out that um, in order for the universe, the vacuum state, to be stable throughout the whole history of the universe, uh, the parameter needs to be between, basically between 0 and 1. And so that gives us a very nice uh, measurement determination of the, of, of the value of this pre-parameter in the standard model. And this also made some headlines. The Higgs boson threatened the early universe, but gravity, the, the, this parameter, basically describes how the Higgs interacts with gravity. Gravity saved the day. So if this parameter has the right, right value, then uh, the vacuum state is safe. And this illustrates one way in which we can use cosmological data. In this case, just the fact that the universe survived uh, the very, its very first moment uh, to, to uh, make statements about the properties of the elementary particles. Here, we managed to get a value of this parameter uh, that describes the uh, interaction between the Higgs and space-time curvature. But there are other aspects um, of the Higgs physics that we can also try to, if you understand them well enough, we can try to um, test with cosmological observations. And there are, um, there's lots of data available currently from the cosmic microwave background, for instance, the Planck satellite. And in future, also from gravitational waves, ripples of space-time, which um, are even better way of observing the early universe because the universe was always transparent to gravitational waves. And so if we understand quantum field theory and the behavior of the Higgs field well enough, then we can, um, can make predictions for this kind of observations then we can hopefully uh, test the, the uh, physics of the Higgs field and other particle physics at much higher energies than we can reach with Large Hadron, than we can reach with the Large Hadron Collider. And finally, very briefly, I wanted to say something about magnetic monopoles, which I mentioned at the beginning, uh, hypothetical particles with a single magnetic pole, which we are searching with this metal experiment at the Large Hadron Collider. And this is again um, a case where the, um, the theoretical, we, we need a much better theoretical understanding because if, in order to make use of the experimental data, make sense of the results, we need to have theoretical predictions that we can compare with. And the problem is that um, Paul Dirac, showed 
more, more than 80 years ago that uh, the magnetic charge, if magnetic monopoles exist, has to be very large, very strong. And therefore, the perturbation theory methods I mentioned earlier don't work. And so therefore, describing magnetic monopoles in quantum field theory is a hard open theoretical problem. And one thing we've been doing is developing computer simulation methods which don't rely on the, this perturbative expansion in terms of these diagrams to calculate properties of magnetic monopoles and ultimately the, um, make predictions for their production. In some cases, like here, you can see this as a simpler um, uh, but analogous objects to magnetic monopoles. We can describe and understand the production of um, some topological defects uh, very, very well. But in general, when you have genuine quantum field theory effects involved, then the calculations become difficult. And unfortunately, that is precisely the case with magnetic monopoles. And just to illustrate what is going on is, is really that when you use the intuition based on these perturbative calculations, which work incredibly well for normal particle physics, um, the prediction is that the production rate of magnetic monopoles in particle collisions at the Large Hadron Collider should be very high, and therefore to be easy to produce these particles. But you can also view uh, from a different theoretical perspective, view the process of production of magnetic monopoles as a tunneling phenomenon, as we were talking about. And in that case, the production rate should be very low because tunneling in general is a very low process. And so the predictions from these two pictures, neither of which is, we can really trust, the prediction is very different. And so we don't really have any handle at the moment on how easy it should be to produce these magnetic monopole particles at the Large Hadron Collider. And if we don't have that, then what can we say about the results of the experiments? So the full quantum field theory calculation is therefore crucial for making sense of the results of the experiments. And this is something I'm, uh, I've been working on with uh, David Weir, who's here, and uh, my current uh, student, Oliver Gould. And this is also the subject of this Monopole Quest exhibit at the Royal Society Summer Science Exhibition. So just again, remind you, if you're interested, please come and visit us. And so now I'll just uh, finish. So what I've shown you is we've got this very nice um, theory, the standard model of particle physics, which describes everything except gravity all elementary particles. But knowing the elementary particles is really only the beginning. And we can do some calculations with it using these perturbation theory methods. And it's very successful in simple processes. And mostly the processes that we are probing with the Large Hadron Collider are simple and it works very well there. But there are many big open questions for which it's not enough. Our current understanding is not enough, and we need a better understanding of quantum field theory. And uh, the examples I highlighted was the behavior of the Higgs field in the early universe and magnetic um, monopoles and their uh, production. And so, in some sense, um, what this is about is like learning to play a musical instrument, like the piano. So, we know what the know all the keys, we know what sound comes when I push a key. I can play some very simple melodies with the piano, but that doesn't mean that I can actually play the piano. And that's basically uh, where we are with, with, with the standard model of particle physics. We still haven't really learned to make the most of it. We really haven't learned to play the quantum field properly. Thank you.